outcome. Uh, we've had, <clears throat> you know, a few of those that, uh, you know, that, that certainly don't feel good about um, anything that you do the next day or the next, you know, uh, opportunity to get before you play again. So, you know, you have to look at everything that you do, examine everything that you do on a day-to-day -day basis and, and make sure that um, you're addressing those things that are most important to getting the right outcomes. Look, when you don't get the right outcomes, uh, immediately it's going to be, you know, uh, take this action, do this, um, you know, bench that guy, fire that guy. It, it's much more about, for us, um, you know, understanding that we have a process in place, we have to stick with our process, and then maybe are there things that you have to tweak within that. And, and that's how I've operated for over 34 years. Uh, I'm certainly going to uh, feel the pain of our entire state when we're not successful. This is an important um, uh, position and, and one where uh, we've got a great following. So uh, you can be assured that every ounce of our energy, every minute in the day is focused on how do we get the right outcomes. Um, and, and that certainly uh, was the case after the Florida game. You know, obviously, um, we missed some opportunities. Um, you know, clearly you have to score touchdowns uh, in this game. Kicking field goals is not enough. We're not scoring enough points. And, and we're giving up plays, uh, explosive plays on defense. So uh, if you want to know where the focus is, you know, that is largely the focus um, you know, moving forward. Uh, there were a lot of positive things, 92 plays on offense and 42 minutes in possession time, 23 first downs. We have a system in place, but it's not turning to what's most important, and that is points at the end of the day. So again, have to re-examine that. Was pleased that there was a much more um, balanced running attack. Uh, if you take out the negative plays, uh, it was about 186 yards in rushing. Uh, that's more to my liking. Um, you know, we had a chance to get our hands on the ball a couple of times on defense, um, but it came down to a couple of explosive plays. I think it was three touchdowns in 11, cons in 11 total plays. So, you know, we know where uh, we have to address, uh, you know, our, our uh, issues there. Um, you know, again, as, as we begin now to, to get ready for Vanderbilt, um, well acquainted with Clark. He's done a great job of building this program. Um, you know, six and four this year with a great win over Alabama, Kentucky, and Auburn. Um, it's a tough and physical defense. Uh, they, they play it um, in a manner to, to keep the points down. Um, and, and I think defensively, uh, just do a really good job in, in terms of balance uh, against the rush and against the pass. You know, obviously, the, the offensive structure has changed. Um, Diego Pavia leads their team in rushing, completion percentage at 60%. Uh, he's a tough, um, hard-nosed player, uh, and, and he is, uh, he is the, the guy that, that makes it happen for him. Um, Alexander is a, a really good back. I really love the tight end. Eli Stowers um, and, and Quincy Skinner, uh, a really good wide receiver. So this is a talented football team with a veteran offensive line. Their special teams is outstanding. Um, their kicker, I think he's got multiple kicks over 50 yards. Uh, love the punt returner, Martell Height. I think he's got about a 17-yard average. Um, and, you know, you've got to defend the running game. It's really triple option in a lot of ways. You know, this is, you know, akin to playing when I was at Notre Dame Navy and Army, uh, Air Force. Um, and, and then, you know, there's certainly our players uh, want to finish the right way. You know, we've got two games plus a bowl game. We've got three games to play. Uh, and it's important that we finish out strong, especially in Tiger Stadium. So um, with that, I'll open up to questions. Brian, you, you mentioned maybe tweaks to the process. Is there anything that you're going to want to try to do differently or just how are you going to go about keeping this team together after three straight losses here toward the end? Yeah, those are things that we'll meet on today. Uh, you know, Monday is an important day. We get the team back. And so uh, we'll get to talk about some of the things that are important um, relative to 
Look, you know, I think we have it up here, uh, motivation. It's your job to motivate you. I mean, our players understand it's their job to motivate, but as coaches, you know, we, we also have to show them uh, clearly uh, the things that they've done well, right? So they have to be motivated about the things they've done well. As I mentioned, take the Alabama game out of the mix. We had three games going late into the third quarter where we have a chance to win those games. Legitimate, not like pie in the sky. Well, I think we can win these games. These are games that we believed we could have won and should have won. Well, that puts you at nine and one. You're probably in the top five in the country. That team, I can stand here and say, we didn't get the job done. We didn't finish. But this football team is far from um, not believing that they can do the job and get the job done. So we'll talk about that today. And then um, when we talk about you know, tweaking the process, it's about what, what's important right now for these next two weeks, 12 days, what's important right now? And maybe shift their focus a little bit more on some of the things that will help us close out games. That's how we'll move forward today. Coach, uh, Deshaun Womack, I b believe he didn't uh, travel with the team this past week. What's his availability uh, with you guys moving forward? He'll be available this week. Brian, in the post game, you talked about fighters and quitters. How do you identify? I, I didn't talk about quitters. I talked about fighting. Okay. Yes. How do you identify the fighters this week? What's it, what's it going to take for you to say, that's my guy? Yeah, I think, you know, when, when you go out to practice for two hours, my, you, you know the guys that are invested, the guys that are um, bought in. And, and this football team is, is bought in. They're disappointed, just like our fan base, just like our coaches. We're all disappointed that we haven't gotten the outcomes that we want. But this is a group that has resilience, that has grit, uh, we've built it in this program, and, and they'll respond. Now, for those that choose not to, that's their choice. They're, they'll have the autonomy to make those choices. But there's nowhere to hide when you go out on that practice field. You, you can't hide it, right? You have to put in the effort. You have to put in the time. You have to prepare the right way. And, and I'm confident in our group in terms of how they'll do that. We're on the right. After the game, you talked about the head coach needing to get more involved when things aren't going well. Can you walk us through what the process is in game for play calling right now? Yeah, Joe Sloan uh, will call the plays. They'll they'll certainly uh, be on my headset. And look, at, like any head ca head coach, he's going to be involved in the ultimate decision of whether uh, that's a go or, or a no go. Uh, now, as you know, communication has broadened. Uh, that communication includes the quarterback as well. So it can't be this long, uh, you know, conversation about, you know, this play, that play, or it becomes confusing to what he's hearing in his ear uh, because the head coach is on that and the play caller, both on defense and offense. So there's only three of us that have that with the green dot. Is the sheriff in here in game two? Yes, yes, yeah. I, he can, he can, I can override that. I choose not to, um, but, but it's something that you can do if you wanted to as the head coach. The, the key here is the ability to make sure that the game is uh, going in the manner that I want it to go in. Um, and at times, you have to take that action as a head coach. Not that somebody's being put in the penalty box, but, but making sure it goes through the vision that I have for that particular game. Coach, um, you, since you arrived, you said that you wanted to build your program through high school recruiting. Yeah. Are you seeing where this transfer portal coming up that you're going to need a, a number that you probably wouldn't like to have to go for? Or, and is that number, you think, going to be that way f for years to come? Just The transfer portal will not go away. You're absolutely right. And the transfer portal will be something that we have to investigate and look at. Um, I do not want a program that is um, built, if you will, on, on the portal. We have to rely on young players. We are playing a lot of young players, as you know, right now, first-year players, um, those that are here for a very short period of time. Uh, we have 19 coming in at mid-semester. So uh, we're still going to be playing some younger players, but there needs to be the right mix and right balance. So the transfer portal will be something that is examined closely, and if we feel like there's a particular need there to balance off our football team, we're certainly going to be invested in that. Given... Uh, Paul Mubanga's struggles this past weekend. Is Tyree Adams available for more snaps potentially at left guard? 
Yeah, I mean, we're going to play the guys that we think give us the best chance, right? I mean, whoever's assessment relative to who played and how they played um, is, is really an assessment left to our coaching staff. We'll decide who the best guys are. Uh, Tyree was forced into action, as you know, when uh, Miles went down and he went in and he competed uh, the best he could given somebody that hadn't played in quite some time. So uh, both of those guys are still going to be in the mix. Both of those guys are still in, in the phases of, you know, getting early snaps. In other words, in their career early snaps. So they're still developing, quite frankly. Um, but we're high on both of them. Uh, both of them will be ready to play this weekend. Hey, I know recruiting is, tends to be long term, but do you call your commitments and guys that are close to committing more over the next, you know, now uh, after a three game losing streak than you would, you know, had you won three of those or two of those? Um, I would hope that we are calling them as much uh, as if we were winning three games as, as the same as we're losing three games. Um, Look, in, in today's world, uh, with, re with revenue sharing, NIL, uh, transfer portal, all of those things, uh, you have to maintain these relationships throughout the entire year. Um, so whether there's an uptick, whether we've lost a couple of games or not, there should not be. There should be a constant communication uh, with those players. And I think it, uh, under my watch and understanding what I see every week, because we meet on this um, four times during the week, um, our guys have done the right things in terms of communication. It seems like the timing maybe between Chris Hilton and Garrett Nussmeyer hasn't quite been there since he's come back, and particularly with the, the jumping for deep balls. Yeah. How do you kind of work with him on those so that he runs through the catch? Well, you want to do that in practice, and, and we've had conversations in practice about using your speed um, and, and continue to keep your feet on the ground. Um, look, Chris desperately, desperately wants to make plays for us. Um, and he's in that mindset. And I think it's much more about um, letting the game come to you. Uh, and, and part of that is he's been out so long and, and he wants to make an impact. So this is really about a guy that's anxious and, and wants to make plays and, and really has to let the game come to him. Um, matter of fact, that was the conversation we had on the sideline. Um, and, and understanding that these are the things that we talked about in practice and they're still showing up in the game, let the game come to you. And uh, he clearly understood that. Two, if I can, was there anything that Florida identified on the outside that enabled them to have success, or was that just you know, a one-on-one -on -one opportunity that they got the better of? Well, I mean, I think you can take a look at the shots. The, the, the big touchdown that was the second touchdown, the late one, we were in double coverage. Uh, we were doubling uh, inside and out, um, Zai Alexander, uh, and, and Jordan Gilbert, they were doubling that receiver. Um, we got beat on a double move, um, a slant and go uh, with Stamps, and we got beat in the slot with, with PJ. So you got three different scenarios there where we got beat in man coverage, and you know, obviously, you know, if you have to look back on it, you go, maybe we should have played more zone. But we've got to have the ability to play some man-to-man -man coverage. And unfortunately, this weekend against Florida, in those three instances which I brought up, we, we did not get the job done. And secondly, you guys had a successful intermediate passing game early in the season. It doesn't mm -hmm. seem to be as prevalent right now. Is there something that you can identify as getting back to, or is it literally just timing and having the opportunity to make those throws? Uh, no, I think teams have, have decided, here's how we want to play you. Um, and, and you know, we have to be able to uh, push the ball vertically. Uh, and, and that's really what we're um, addressing and, and making sure that we do everything in our practice um, to connect on those. I think you saw three balls that were thrown down the field. All three we missed on uh, in, in some fashion. Uh, those balls need to be completed. We need to push the ball because we have you know, defenders that are sitting on all of our routes and, and making it more difficult than it was earlier in the year. If I can get two about Vanderbilt, uh, you're going to face Diego Pavia, a good running quarterback. Anything you do differently this week? And then also, you mentioned Clark Lee, uh, was with you for four years at Notre Dame. Could you identify the things then that would make him a good head coach and maybe just a thought on him sort of persevering after some rough seasons to break through this year? Yeah, uh, good question. I think, you know, first of all, in terms of defense, I, I think you have to have a different mindset when you go against this 
uh, offense. This is truly assignment-oriented football, uh, and you have to be disciplined. Much like what that offense brings you is they want to catch you undisciplined. They want to catch you doing something uh, that's not your job. So the big focus this will be disciplined and getting your job done uh, in all three phases, uh, inside, out, and on the perimeter. As it relates to Clark, you know, Clark is extremely locked into uh, what his process is and how he's developed his process. He stayed steadfast with that, even through some of the rougher years, and that's why they're on the other side of this. Um, they, they haven't uh, gone for the flavor of the week. Uh, this has been a consistent approach as a head coach saying, this is our system, this is our process, this is how we do things, and we're sticking with it, and you can start to see how that's paying off for him today. Absolutely. I mean, that's the way he ran everything. All of our meetings were uh, in lockstep. Uh, everything that we did was uh, in, in a consensus, which I'm certain he's getting that same consensus within his program at Vanderbilt. You referenced that conversation with Chris on the field. Do, do your office hours get extended in tough times? Is your open door even more open? And how do you handle communication with the, with the athletes? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, look, as I said earlier, there's nobody here in this building that's happy about where we are and what the outcomes are. Essentially, what you're, you're doing more than anything else is, is you know, getting um, the autonomy or the feedback from your players. Because they, listen, they have their stakeholders in this as well. And, and so you want to hear what they have to say. You know, what, what are the things that we need to stop doing? What are the things that we need to start doing? What are the things that we need to do more of? And so we're always asking those things from our players and getting that kind of feedback. So yeah, your door better be open. It better be a revolving door, especially in times like this that are rough. Um, they're hard on anybody that follows LSU football. They're hard on the head coach and the assistant coaches and the players and the guy that sweeps out here and, and cleans up in, in this building, uh, the janitors. Uh, everybody's affected uh, when, when LSU uh, football loses and, and players obviously even more so. In that game against Alabama that Vanderbilt had, what, what, what allowed them to be so effective in, in moving the ball so consistently in that game? I think it was just a disciplined approach to what they were doing play in and play out. Um, you know, I, I think it's like anything else. W would Alabama made some adjustments now that they have gone through that? I, I think probably um, they, they've grown from that. Uh, and But I will say that their consistent approach, they didn't they didn't go away from it. They were not afraid um, to continue to do what they were doing, punt the football, play field position, and then be opportunistic defensively. Uh, they did a great job defensively in that game, and that sometimes gets overlooked how well they played in that game defensively. Hey, Coach, you mentioned eliminating the big plays after this yeah. loss to Florida, and I believe that after the game, Witt said that on Florida's last touchdown, the defense was running two different things. Is it surprising that that kind of thing's happening at this point in the season, and how do you go about fixing that? Yeah, I mean, look, am I, I'm, I'm disappointed that, that certainly there was a feeling that there were some mixed calls or signals out there. Um, I, I think one of the big things that we've learned in this new era of communication in the headset uh, for the players is uh, there needs to be one voice, one voice. Uh, even if you have the green dot, um, the one voice needs to be consistent and constant. Uh, and maybe that occurred. You know, we're trying to get to the end of that too and, the, the, and, and what happened there. But clearly that's on us as coaches. We have to make sure that there's clear communication uh, and that there's no mixed messages relative to what being called. We have a guy on the sideline who's signaling everything in. That hasn't changed. We haven't stopped signaling. So there's no reason why you can't get the signal. But if you hear something, uh, we then have to address what is that collateral sound out there that they're hearing that would not put them in the right call. So we have to take onus on that. We have to make sure that that never happens again. Um, with Garrett, I know that there was the one fumble there in the second half. But considering the pressure he was facing most of the game, were you pleased with his decision making and just kind of the, it looked like he threw the ball away several times when nothing was there. I mean, just maybe talk about maybe the one game growth you might have seen in that department. I thought he was extremely uh, in intentional about his actions, um, you know, in terms of 
taking care of the football. And he would say that to me coming off the field. Maybe I could have done this, but I was very intentional about making sure we took great care of the football. Um, and, and look, he is in the, in the midst of this continuous improvement in the pocket, and I think he's doing a really nice job. There's room for growth there, and, and the great part about it is he's up for it. You know, he wants to get better in this first year of being a starter, and I'm excited about coaching him. I know everybody that, that is with um, Garrett uh, has a guy that is totally committed to being better and better each week. Update on your offensive lineman. Is Dellinger going to be available to practice this week, and is Miles also? Yeah, we believe that, that Miles will be able to practice this week. Dellinger will still be um, where do we think he is uh, early in the week to make a decision later in the week. We're getting closer. We're getting closer where we think uh, there's a chance that he could play, but we won't make that decision until probably midweek. And then with Diego, their quarterback, just so much of his game seems to be talent, sure, but willingness, heart, desire, mm -hmm. those are things that you have to you know, take into account for, I'm sure, when you're, pre when you're preparing for a quarterback like that. What, what can you emphasize about your team that the play is probably never over? Well, you know, again, I, I think you have to be able to match, um, you know, the want and desire of any opponent that we play in this league with the same want and desire. I am pleased with my football team's want and desire. Um, they have prepared very well. The one thing that we've done well is we've prepared, as I mentioned to you, you know, three games going late into the third quarter where we have a chance to win. And that's not, as I said, that's not just trying to put a good spin on it. So you know their preparation's pretty good, their want to and their desire to play hard. Now we have to execute when execution is needed at its highest level, and that falls on both of us, players and coaches alike, to get our players in the position so they can be successful and close out football games. But I really do um, believe that our preparation and our want to is, is going to match a, a guy like Diego uh, who has a, a, a great desire to play. This weekend, obviously, we're in a more of an option look, and, and we'll see how that fits. But we were pleased with Devon in terms of what he did, being asked to be uh, involved in the game the way he was. Um, we were pleased with, with what he did for us when, when he was given that opportunity. Coach, I know you can, you're going to evaluate everything once the season is over with across the board, but do you have any questions in your own mind about maybe the strength and power of this team? And, there's a lot of new age techniques. Do you think maybe some of that's getting away from the core lifts and stuff that's done in the offseason? No, I have no problem with our strength and conditioning program. It's one that I've run for a long time. Matter of fact, I think we bring in the science as well as anybody in the country. I think Alabama, um, their head strength coach was, was on my staff. Um, we share a lot of the data. We share a lot of the work that we do. Uh, we just came uh, through our final phase of testing here uh, in the 1st of November, uh, wh which we call our peak phase. And uh, guys made incredible improvements. A, a guy like DJ Chester is 142% uh, of his averages. That's how high he has increased his strength throughout the season. So uh, we actually have a way of looking at that data. Instead of saying, well, I think he's stronger, or well, while he looks stronger, we have data that will allow us to say, you know what, your peak numbers are down. And, and let's look at the reasons why. Is this effort? Is this injury? And some of it is sometimes, like, for example, we have a speed squat that we do. Um, Miles is down a little bit. He's about 92% of his max. But he's had this ankle, right? So he couldn't be as explosive, you know, during those testing periods. So. We're pretty exhaustive in the sports science division here. We think we send a really good message and a trend out there uh, that we have that data that we can build our football team on. Uh, you guys showed some uh, real improvement in the running game this past week. What were some of the things that you guys were doing better in the run game, especially in that was it that one drive, I think early third quarter, where I think it just stalled out in the red zone, but it was a very impressive drive. Commitment, commitment to, to running the football um, in, in all downs and distances. As you know, this is the first time we've run it on first, second, third, and fourth down um, all year. Uh, so every down, uh, a commitment to the run game. And, and mixing it up, 
You know, we were outside zone to one side. Uh, we were counter back the other side. We were a toss. Uh, we were split zone. Um, you know, we had some reverses and some handoff sweeps, largely not as effective as we would have liked uh, in, in the fourth down situation. But I think versatility to the run game and commitment to it, and then the play action off of it is absolutely crucial as well. Those elements were in play, and they need to continue to be in play. All right, thank you. You're welcome.